so I'm uh, Nathan Fever. I work at Yarnstick. Uh, we do testing and training software. So uh, basically, people need to do training for safety or for uh, basically think of like your standardized tests that you take in school or whatever. Uh, how do we provide that online? Uh, so uh, I'm from the U.S., so I'm thinking of like my SATs and my uh, all of those things. So I go through this like online test and I fill out all the answers. And uh, we also have so I work on the training side, which is more like an LMS. So a learning management system, um, and uh, it's a lot of fun. We're right down the street. And I would say I'm a Ruby on Rails developer more than a JavaScript person. But uh, we do a lot of Angular, uh, Angular 1.x, wherever it is. And uh, we are starting to work on an Angular 2 Ionic app, so that should be, should be fun. But, uh, so that's like my background and JavaScript experience. Uh, I want to talk about Elm. So what is Elm? Uh, Elm is a programming language that compiles into JavaScript. So uh, have people used CoffeeScript, raise your hand. So a fair bit of experience. Uh, CoffeeScript is also a language that compiles into JavaScript. It's very similar to JavaScript. Uh, Elm is not similar to JavaScript. Uh, but but the, the concept with CoffeeScript is, is similar. So CoffeeScript tries to take your uh, your your logical, this is what I write uh, code, and turn it into JavaScript that's safe. So some JavaScript that you just write uh, has gotchas that, that are unexpected, and CoffeeScript will try to help take care of that for you. Um, Elm is, is also similar in that regard. It will take your uh, your Elm code and turn it into very, very simplified JavaScript that uh, is not going to have gotchas in it. And in fact, I got originally excited about Elm because uh, I was hearing someone else give a talk on it. And they said that Elm has zero uh, Zero runtime exceptions, so you know you, you're running into something s strange in the <coughs> browser. And you're like, wait a minute, open up JavaScript console. There's this big red error. And you're like, ah. So, so Elm, uh, uh, it's claimed the fame, or well, like the the tagline that everyone uses is that it has zero runtime exceptions, which is really cool. Um, I, I love that that it can uh, can control the environment in, in such a way to, to achieve that feat. Uh, so the rest we will be talking about. Uh, so why should I try Elm other than what I just talked about? Well. Why should I develop software? So why do why does Nathan develop software? Uh, these are called murmurations, and these I think software is really cool, and I think these are really cool too. Uh, so there's these are flocks of birds just flying, and uh, they've come up with really simple rules that help these birds fly in these flocks. And uh, they make really cool patterns. I guess I should have shown a video because they look, they almost look like uh, you laugh because you know. They're like uh, the northern lights almost. They like, 
uh, sway and move and really cool pattern. So uh, each one of these birds is thinking independently and they create this uh, pattern on a larger scale. So uh, the birds move in the same direction as their neighbors. They uh, remain close to their neighbors. They don't want to get too far away because they don't want to get eaten by a hawk. And they also want to avoid running into their neighbors. And this is what creates this cool, uh, uh, this murmuration of this flock. So uh, software, I think, is really cool because you come up with these simple uh, uh, patterns, these simple building blocks, and out of them you get really cool uh, behavior. And, and I love that I'm encouraged to make something as simple as possible. If it's complex, slow down, can you make it in a way that's more simple? And, and, and then over time, uh, when, you, when you come back to that and you're like, I need this in a slightly different way, these simple building blocks all of a sudden are this murmuration. It's like you're, you've got two things going on and, and, and they're both using the same code in very different ways, but it, it's working uh, perfectly. So, so that's what I like. Uh, code is easy. It's not easy to write, but it, it creates an ease in, uh, in, your, in, your, in your, the way that you can think about it, and the way that you can read it. Uh, it makes an impact. Uh, you leave a legacy. I'm, I'm just <laughs> going a little bit on a, on a soapbox here. So, but why, I, I think, man, uh, this is awesome. Why, why do people not think that uh, writing code is awesome? It's because actually writing code is hard and you run into failures. And so uh, earlier we talked about the, the JavaScript console and you're just like pulling out your hair and, um, you start running into these and you like, <coughs> don't know why and you're, uh, you, just, you give up uh, and go home. And so, <coughs> so how can we avoid that? Well, let's use Elm. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Elm with the community <coughs> uh, being a big factor, the compiler, and how it treats you as a developer is, uh, I think, something that we see more and more. But uh, I think Elm does it really well to, to uh, give you helpful, uh, helpful notes and uh, no runtime exceptions, so you don't see uh, that JavaScript red. And uh, it works in small doses. So you can try it out in a project with just a little bit of your project written in Elm and the rest written in, uh, you know, for me, Angular or uh, um, whatever project you're using. And uh, I, I say different style because it's written, in, uh, Elm is a pure functional programming language and uh, so it's like eating your vegetables <laughs> uh, so um, my first point is that the community is really good uh, and and maybe this is uh, hard to understand why is a programming language good for this community but the uh, I find that as a, a developer, the more I get into it, the more I can trust the people behind the project, 
the more I can trust uh, the actual project. So uh, I know that uh, that the people in Elm are going to continue to stick with it and going to continue to support it and, and try to make it better. So, so that's why I bring this up. This is Evan. Uh, he's the creator of Elm, and uh, I. Uh, first heard about Elm and I kind of like my interest was peaked and then I watched this uh, video by uh, this talk by Evan and I was convinced that I needed to go try this. Uh, so you listen to Evan and he's just this uh, really friendly guy. He's brilliant. I, 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 Feel like he's a step above the rest, and uh, but he's also very cognizant of being friendly and being uh, focused on the uh, the beginner. So, what is the beginner's experience, and and how can we take these really amazing? concepts and make them more approachable uh, or or most approachable so that uh, beginners and experts alike can can be as productive as possible uh, so i say he's the, the bdfl uh, because uh, that's that stands for benevolent dictator for life <laughs> Uh, so this is a, f a title first given to the, the Python, the creator of the Python programming language. And uh, it just means that he's going to be making the decisions. He's a dictator when it comes to this open source project. But he's uh, also there for life. So he he's uh, committed to this for the long term. His, uh, this is him on GitHub, and uh, whenever I look at someone from the community, I'm looking at their GitHub page and seeing what their projects are, so uh, I included that. Uh, other members of the community I've found really friendly. There's uh, a Slack. Uh, community that you can join. The beginner room there has a lot of people that I've uh, found that are always on. I don't know how they have the time and the energy to, to be there, uh, but they are there and um, have helped me a lot. And uh, I would say the community is a small community, but it's growing rapidly. There's um, people get excited and things like tend to stick around and tell their friends. Uh, I saw a graph of the number of GitHub repositories in Elm, and it's increasing exponentially. So that's a good sign. And uh, I feel like in general, people are passionate. I talked about the compiler. Uh, so now, yeah, let's talk about the compiler. Uh, Evan, the, the creator, I told you was friendly and aiming, wanting his programming language to be aimed at a beginner level. So here uh, we have a, uh, a line of Elm code that I've evaluated in the like console. So uh, if string.length of user.firstName, uh, then valid, else invalid. So I'm, I'm just saying if uh, in JavaScript I would say, oh, is there a string there? And uh, in Ruby I would do, I can do the same thing because string is a truthy concept. But but Elm doesn't have a truthy concept. It only has true and false. So 
uh, it tells you that uh, you have given me a condition with this type. It's an int. Uh, but I need it to be a boolean. Uh, and then it even gives you a hint uh, down the bottom that it doesn't have truth in this. Uh, and, and we should think about things explicitly. Uh, this comes from a, uh, another talk by Richard Feldman. Uh, I thought his examples were really good, so I <coughs> grabbed them. Uh, additionally, uh, in, in JavaScript, uh, you can do string concatenation in a whole bunch of different ways. So maybe you think you can do it that, uh, in Elm as well. So you want to uh, come up with a full name. So you do full name equals first name plus space plus the last name. But uh, it says that the, the plus operator here is confused. Uh, so hint, to append strings in L, you need to use the plus plus operator and not plus. And it gives you a little link. I also like that the error messages are well spaced out. It uh, doesn't cram everything into one line, so you you can see very clearly that like once you start to get used to looking at these error messages, <coughs> what to look for. And, uh, yeah. All right, uh, no runtime exceptions. So I told you earlier that Elm is a very different language than, than JavaScript. It's not uh, like CoffeeScript. So uh, because it's very different, it can look through your code ahead of time and see all of the pathways that your program can take and, and see where your, uh, your exceptions are going to happen. And, and tell you to fix them before it actually creates the JavaScript that will create that, those red uh, console errors. So it, it has a really cool type system. Uh, the, the type system is uh, similar to the one in Haskell, and Haskell's from um, the world of academia, and uh, has all this awesome math behind it, and uh, uh, I say it's awesome math, but in, in, in Elm, it, it turns into awesome code, and you're like, I can do so much with just the type system. It's, uh, it's really cool. Uh, it also has pure functions and immutable data. So uh, that's something that takes a little bit of getting used to when you're first learning it, but allows it to do some of the magic uh, that it does. Uh, so if you want to get started uh, with Elm, uh, it it c comes in small doses. So you can uh, drop an L, I say JavaScript interoperability, because you can drop an Elm application into an existing JavaScript application. Uh, and uh, like add it to a specific div in a page. So if you just want a button to be written in Elm, and then when it's, uh, yeah, you can, anyway, you, can, uh, you can create just a small part of your application in, in Elm. Uh, you can also uh, put JavaScript into an Elm application. This is uh, much, this is a bit more tricky. Uh, Elm has very specific rules about how you can do this. So you, so you can't just put anything into uh, Elm. 
it helps if uh, if it's something that's uh, self-sufficient or uh, can can do what it does by itself. I reference like a date picker or select times, an input field that's got nice um, options because those things tend to uh, do their own thing and then when they're you're done picking your date it just updates the value of them in the past field. Um, so different style, I said, say, uh, said it earlier, it's like eating your vegetables. Um, I've found that uh, learning functional programming on the side has helped me write uh, object-oriented programming code, mm -hmm. uh, or, or JavaScript really is a fusion of, of functional languages and object-oriented languages, and so it helps me write uh, better code because I know I have more tools in my toolbox now. So, uh, so here's some links to uh, the resources that I, I mentioned. Um, I have this talk online, and it's, this is going to be tweeted out later, but uh, <coughs> speakerdeck.com slash jfever if you want to see any of my uh, talks. And then I'm going to I'm, I want to look at some some actual Elm code, but uh, first, are there any questions? So, uh, some concept I have been <coughs> confused about the uh, partial orientation and query. Do you have uh, an experience about that? Uh, any because most of people think that partial orientation and query the same, but some say that's different. Uh, Oh, partial application, partial function application and currying. Uh, I am probably not going to answer that question correctly. <laughs> 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 They're kind of like different perspectives, the same concept. So yeah. partial application is the kind of okay, here's my function. Technically, it's like a function of many different arguments, and each one gives you another one. Okay, but but basically, partial application means I'm only going to pass you one of all of your required parameters. I get back is a partially applied function, and only mm -hmm. it only it has one of the parameters set, but you can later decide to provide the rest. Yes, that's partial application. Currying is taking a function that takes multiple arguments <coughs> and then turning into smaller functions that each only takes one argument. <laughs> so if you have a long list of arguments, yeah. uh, Korean would take this this long list of arguments and turn into several different several of, uh, yeah, of functions that return function. only have one argument. I believe that's correct. <laughs> so partial application functions like a factory returns another partial application function? Yeah, you could, you could kind of think. That's kind of like a factor, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, so one of the hardest things about pure immutability is that it kind of breaks down at the I.O. level, and maybe it's easier for just looking code for what you're doing and how that as far as like non Sure. Uh, so uh, the question is that uh, when you start working on pure functional programming, you uh, uh, the the like the thing about pure. What's pure is that uh, your code has no side effects, and when you do I/O, uh, when you go to the database, or when you uh, check for uh, things that have changed in the outside world, or you go to an API, all of these things are inherently impure. And so it's very hard to 
do functional programming when uh, you want to stick in this pure world, but you don't know where to draw the bound, like create the boundaries to, to the, the side effects that are happening. So Elm, I think, uh, does a pretty good job of that. Um, uh, my first experience of this was I was um, trying to figure out the date, and I was like, okay, this is easy. I'll just uh, ask for the current date, and uh, and and Elm. I started looking through Elm stuff, and was like, oh, you can't just ask for the current date. Um, because it's an impure function, like you ask for the date and it's going to change every time you ask for it. So, um, so Elm uh, has a loop that it goes through. Uh, I think of game development where you have this loop that's always running and on each loop your character moves forward like one step or whatever. Um, in, in Elm, you go through one loop and you say, I need the date. And then, uh, and that's like the, the finish of that loop. And then on the beginning of the next loop, Elm says, okay, here's that, that date that you wanted. And here it is as data. So, so uh, I.O. becomes a stream of data coming into your application. And it, it's very uh, structured as far as how you do that. So, so it provides that, that interface of where, where does the impure stuff <coughs> come in. Uh, and it always comes in in the same, same way. So uh, uh, a challenge I've found is letting that loop get too complicated because you have this <coughs> loop. Now everything has to go through the loop. How do you separate out this stuff into chunks so that it's not just like a mess? Yeah? Uh, is there a verbosity setting on the compiler? Because like you might not want an explanation that there's no truth in this concept in Elm every time you write that. Sure. Oh, sure. Uh, no. Uh, so it's in. <laughs> it's in. Uh, it's in version zero point eighteen. Uh, so that might be something that they want to implement in the future. Uh, for now, it's. It's. Uh, It's so that's like a significant portion of your stream. Yeah. If you have multiple areas you're gonna scroll like this. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I I have found some situations where <coughs> I was uh, running into lots of errors and suddenly it became uh, unwieldy to look at all of them at the same time. But then I got to focus on one error at a time, and uh, sometimes fixing one error is like a cascade of fixing other errors because you you have like a type mismatch in one place, and that creates a type inference which is incorrect in another place, and so. Uh, but yeah. You, you I agree. Uh, the, the spacing is, is uh, something that uh, is very uh, is an opinion of the Helm community. I was also wondering about the uh, zero runtime exception claim. Is that just something that's common with like uh, like Elon Musk type languages, or is that something specific to Helm? And like, how strong is that claim? Like, is that something tested, or is there like like I'm sure, sure. it's hard to throw runtime exception if you really want. Yeah, there there are uh, ways to force runtime exceptions, or there are known compiler bugs that I've run into, uh, where if you do a, a specific bit of code that's just 
uh, bizarre, then, then you're going to get uh, a runtime exception. Uh, Is there a unit testing framework there? Yeah, sure. Um, there is. Okay. Uh, the, the, Richard Feld, the Richard Feldman, uh, this guy, I think, actually wrote. Yeah, I'm not asking this. Oh, yeah? Okay. It looks like a Jasmine. That is pretty good. It looks like Jasmine? OK. Um, I, I've only used it a very little bit. I, that's a good segue. To uh, exorcism. This is a good resource I find for learning all kinds of different programming languages. Uh, basically, you can fetch uh, exercises from their uh, through their program, uh, and it comes with the the uh, the testing framework and the tests already written for you, and then you write the the Elm code to help pass the tests. So it's it's a way that I can write Elm code without having to have a project in mind. I don't have to set up the index.html to include all the stuff. It's just I can start writing code right away, and it's stuff like. Uh, hello world, and then count the things, and then uh, make the person say this, or conditionally that, or you know all all these good tests. Other questions? Um, what's uh, what <coughs> what's the level of adoption to put on my Are we using some production? Um, sure. Is it are these is it common to be used in like hybrid along with JavaScript and kind of common framework, server side, and client side? Yeah. Uh, it hasn't had any like huge corporate uh, backers. Uh, so I feel like the uh, level of adoption is still low for uh, like, uh, enterprise production deployments. Uh, it's a little bit of a broken record here. Uh, Richard Feldman uh, comes up a lot in the community, and so does his company, No Red Inc. It's not his company, but he works there. Um, they're like the one production uh, deployment that you always hear about. So uh, they they have been running uh, Elm for, I think, two years now in production, and have the, the logging set up to log all of their uh, runtime exceptions. And so they get runtime exceptions from like their React side of their app, and they don't get it from their Elm side of the app. So that's where that, that comes from. Um, uh, I really want to know uh, what you think is the catch. Like, like really, what do you what do you hate about Elm? Sure. Uh, so uh, the the getting the date thing that I mentioned earlier. Uh, there's a more ceremony in that. Uh, getting JSON from the server. Uh, you can't just get a bunch of JSON and start working with it. You have to say, in this JSON, I'm going to get this uh, property, and it's going to be this type, and you're going to get this property, it's going to be this type, and this property. So if you're getting like huge amounts of data from some like uh, Google API, and you're only using one property, you still have to decode all of the, the JSON. So uh, I think that's not too much of an issue when you are used to using it. You're going to be fast and proficient, and that's like the simple stuff that is isn't hard to think about. But it is uh, it is there. So uh, 
you have to be okay with ceremony. Nathan, I'm just going to interrupt you and let you know we're at 35 right now. So sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't want to look at anything too complicated. Uh, I was going to look at some of the examples on um, on the website. So. Can you make the text size just a little bit bigger? Yep, for sure. Um, so uh, this is a really simple example. Uh, here, text is a function, and so you need to, to tell uh, Elm that you're Printing out text to the DOM. That's an example. Of it's uh, it needs a type system or whatever. Um, something about uh, Elm that is hard to digest, maybe for some people, uh, is that it controls your HTML. So you're writing Elm code that's a representation of the HTML, and then it's going to print out the HTML. So you can't, uh, you can't give, uh, you can't have part of your HTML being written in the React kind of templating language, and part of it being written in Elm templating language. Like Elm's like, I'm going to take care of all of the HTML for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you can't have your designer writing Haml or their embedded uh, HTML or whatever either. So here's an unordered list. Uh, again, you have functions. So the unordered list function takes uh, a collection of attributes and then a collection of the HTML that's going to be inside it, and then the HTML inside it is list items. Uh, let's look at something more interesting. So a, an Elm program I was telling you earlier has this loop, and so uh, the way it does this is it sets up a type of a program. So in this case, it's a beginner program. And we have a model, and we have an update, which updates each time you go through the loop. And during your loop, you can send different messages. So uh, here we have some buttons that are going to increment and decrement. So we just count up and count down. Um, so uh, let's look at the model maybe. So it's setting the model up here as an integer, and so it just knows that it's an integer. Anyone have questions about this? Yeah, maybe show the um, architecture of the diagram maybe better to understand how it works, right? Sure. Yeah, so uh, the when you compile your Elm Elm program. It's going to compile into a runtime, which is like uh, the library that, that uh, Elm is using. And then it's going to compile into your like application code, application JavaScript. And so the Elm runtime is going to be uh, doing all this stuff to control the loop. And 
Um, and it'll send these messages to your update. Say, hey, this is what's happening. Happening. Uh, you can use the the model or like the how your data of your application is is uh, set up to create the new representation of the DOM, and then Elm is going to look at your representation of the DOM that you created in the view and say it's a little bit different from how the DOM is now. So let's change that small bit of HTML. Um, it can do this really efficiently. Uh, it uh, doesn't create as many, uh, like it doesn't recreate all of the DOM elements on every single loop. It just changes what it needs to. And uh, I should have mentioned in my talk that it's, it's very fast, so that's another reason to try Elm. It's uh, faster than Angular, it's faster than React. Uh, and this is in its own test course, but. Um, yeah. I, I had a question for you. Um, is there a feature, I guess, that uh, I think realistically it would be hard for some projects to adopt Elm, um, but are there features of Elm that you wish kind of JavaScript adopted and became part of the JavaScript language? Sure. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited about uh, trying TypeScript mm -hmm. in uh, this new Ionic uh, Angular 2 application that we're working on at, uh, at Yardstick. So I think, I think that adding types mm -hmm. to my code will help catch uh, issues before they come up. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, it's hard. Uh, I, I <coughs> like that it's this uh, like fun pure functional programming mm -hmm. language, mm -hmm. but that's I'm not sure if that's just me getting excited it <laughs> or because I'm not I'm not fluent with it like I am with norm vanilla JavaScript. Mm -hmm. So so um, maybe, but I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Um like if I can answer that question for you, um, pattern matching would be really cool to have that JavaScript, right? Sure. Yeah. So so pattern matching is a concept where uh, you have uh, you can do assignment by the pattern. So uh, I'm thinking of like uh, a comma b equals uh, five comma six, and this is something that. Uh, this is something that maybe you can do in JavaScript and in, in other places, but that, that's the structure, though. Like pattern matches, you have the case statements, and you could actually have like like four facts and like switch statement. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know one thing I've heard from uh, was union types, something that I've heard people really like for error checking in Elm. Sure. Like, would something like that be possible yeah. in JavaScript? Yeah. You know, or I don't really know what union types are. I just heard podcasts where they said, all right, like those. Uh, oh. uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I imagine some smart person could probably figure it out. Mm -hmm. Uh, so union types, uh, this is a union type, I think. Yes. So it's a, a message is either an increment message or a decrement message. Uh, so can you create something like this in JavaScript? Yeah, like you could go decrement of a string 
Anthos and Ink Brand would be stringless, but Decker would have a label or something. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. you could. Yeah. <laughs> you could like have much more complicated kind of like foreign expressions of those unions. So, oh, some of the cases of that kind of order of that type could have different parameters that you could go in. Yeah. Um, the kind of like the most hmm? tree. tree. Yeah, yeah. There's a tree, so you have like no or you know that's tree, or you have a leaf. Yeah. And that's like a basic example. Mm, yeah. yeah. And then a tree is made up of yeah, tree is made up of nodes and leaves and yeah, like your, your type would be type tree equals uh, branch of uh, A and B of tree mm -hmm. or leaf, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and maybe your leaf would be of a generic type. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they like maybe in rest kind of. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. 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 Types have to look like this when you make a new type. In Elm? Yeah. That's where the pattern matching comes in. Because you can match against the specific value. So they so once you get into that branch that has to match it, now we know exactly what they have been doing. So no and then you, you have to handle those all of the sessions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> so one one of the learning curve for me is the task and command. So I hope like this, you or somebody can like speech about that detail about diving into this task. Task? What um what do you mean by task? Because this is uh, like a I am called the manager side effect. So everything is uh, decided by all around the like, one time. So when you do the like uh, HTTP calls you do using a task. Sure. But this is kind of tricky, very tricky to do that. Sure. Uh, yeah. So here's a, a random number. So they want to get a random number. So uh, in one uh, in one part of the update, we we say. Uh, we want to, to get a random number, but we don't get it back yet. And then in, in a subsequent loop of the update, we get back the new face, which has an integer. So uh, in Elm, we do that using commands. Um, So I'd have to go look, look at the, the random library here to show you this really well, or to understand this really well. But it's um, this random.generate is going to give you back a command. And that command is going to message. result in this message. and is going to uh, have a payload of a random integer between one and six. Um, uh, Nathan, just so you know, we're just about to hit 50 minutes. So we'll probably have to wrap it up here. Sure. Uh, I'll just finish with you, Sure. Um, we can roll the dice. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, yeah, if you have more questions, uh, feel free to talk to me. Thank you very much.